While I've titled this particular presentation pneumonia, I sometimes think that a more appropriate title might be lung infections. That's because the term pneumonia is so frequently used colloquially to refer to bacterial and viral lung infections that alternatives like fungal infections may not intuitively leap to everyone's mind when we use the term pneumonia. Also, the definition of pneumonia is not lung infection, but rather lung inflammation. Sometimes that inflammation is infectious in cause, and sometimes it isn't, like in disorders like usual interstitial pneumonia or organizing pneumonia. I think that's why many chest radiologists like myself prefer to use the term lung infection since it's clearer and also encourages a more comprehensive outlook when we discuss infectious disorders in the lung. Though I'm sure I'll slip up a couple of times during this presentation and use pneumonia and lung infection interchangeably too. Okay, we begin with some fundamentals for anyone, not just radiologists, interested in using medical imaging to diagnose or manage a patient who might have a lung infection, starting with an appropriate appreciation for what the role of medical imaging is. And the role of medical imaging will be different depending on if we're talking about an outpatient who's otherwise relatively healthy or someone who's an inpatient or who's immunosuppressed. In the outpatient setting, Primary care physicians may often manage lung infections empirically. While in inpatients and immunosuppressed patients, lung infections may be different, more unusual, and sometimes more aggressive, where therapies need to be much more explicit than empirical. As a consequence, the value radiologists have to add on top of what a primary care physician can already see for themselves on a chest radiograph is somewhat limited in the outpatient setting. On the other hand, with inpatients in immunosuppressed individuals, referring physicians will rely on radiologists more to help narrow down the differential diagnosis for their patient and also catch potential complications. When we're looking for the presence of a lung infection, we're usually looking for the six imaging features that appear in white on the list here. We look for ground glass opacities. Ground glass opacities are regions where the lung appears denser but not so dense that the opacities prevent us from seeing underlying anatomy like pulmonary vessels. One of my friends likes to compare ground glass opacities to looking through tinted car windows. Since ground glass opacities can also occur in the setting of some non-infectious lung disorders, they're not specific for lung infection. Ground glass opacities are usually not visible on chest radiography, and therefore the term ground glass opacity should probably only appear on CT reports. We look for consolidation. Consolidation is when a region of lung appears denser, so dense that underlying anatomy is not visible on unenhanced CT imaging. If ground glass opacities were like looking through a tinted car window, I suppose consolidation would be like trying to look through the car's metal hood. With consolidation, the air spaces are being replaced by fluid, so the volume of the opacified lung is usually preserved and on occasion increased unlike with atelectasis or fibrosis, where the lung is just as dense, but the volume collapsed or retracted. Lung infections can cause consolidation, but so can pulmonary edema or alveolar hemorrhage, so consolidation is not specific for lung infection. Sometimes bronchi within a region of consolidation remain patent, resulting in lucent tubes we call air bronchograms. But Air bronchograms can occur in the setting of atelectasis, fibrosis, or even some malignancies, so air bronchograms are not specific for consolidation. Unlike ground glass opacities, consolidation is usually visible on a chest radiograph. Sometimes consolidation can cavitate and result in a region of internal lucency, and if fluid is introduced into the cavity, an air fluid level may be apparent. We look for centrilobular nodular patterns. Centrilobular nodular patterns appear as innumerable, loosely grouped, tiny, indistinct micronodules that are relatively equidistant from each other and usually don't touch the lung margins or fissures. They're not specific for infection since they're also commonly seen with non-infectious inflammatory conditions like smoking-related respiratory bronchiolitis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Centrilobular nodular patterns are typically invisible on chest radiography we look for tree and bud nodular patterns. Tree and bud nodular patterns are supposed to evoke the appearance of a tree budding in the springtime, 
and present as multiple small clusters of discrete micronodules that are connected by small branching linear opacities. Tree and bud nodular patterns are very specific for lung infection and are sometimes visible on chest radiography as a regional heterogeneous opacity with a subtle micronodular texture. We look for multi acinar lung opacities. multi acinar lung opacities appear as loosely grouped patchy nodular opacities with indistinct margins, often in a segmental distribution. They're sort of specific for lung infection and are often visible on a chest radiograph as a regional opacity that appears heterogeneous and with indistinct margins. Finally, we look for nodules. Nodules that appear in the setting of lung infections can sometimes cavitate and are often visible on chest radiography. As lung infections are not the only cause of a lung nodule, nodules may not be specific for lung infection. These are the six imaging features we typically look for to diagnose a lung infection. Although most of these imaging features are not entirely specific for lung infection, the specificity of medical imaging can improve if multiple features on this list are simultaneously present. Um, if findings contradictory to lung infection are absent elsewhere on the images, and if the patient's presentation contradicts non-infectious differential diagnoses on our list. When we study the natural history and imaging presentation of lung infections in patients, three primary imaging patterns of lung infection evolution emerge that help explain why certain subsets of these six imaging features often may occur together. Some lung infections initially present as ground glass opacities that progressively increase in density to become consolidation. We may see this in viral infections sometimes and opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis. Some infections initially present as a centrilobular nodular pattern that evolves into a tree and bud nodular pattern as the nodular interstitial opacities become denser and segmental and the subsegmental airways become filled with more fluid. If allowed to progress, tree and bud nodular patterns become increasingly confluent, evolving into multi acinar lung opacities that may ultimately progress into consolidation. We can see this with some cases of aspiration pneumonia and mycobacterial lung infections like TB and MAI. Some infections initially present and continue to evolve as lung nodules, a common example often being fungal lung infections. So you can see how it might not be unusual to see ground glass and consolidation occur simultaneously in a case, or centrilobular pattern, tree and bud pattern, multi astronaut opacities and consolidation appear altogether in another case. Lung infections that evolve along the second and third pathways tend to be associated with more collateral damage locally, resulting in phenomena like cavitation or fibrosis. Lung infections that evolve along the first pathway tend to be gentler on the lung and may be less likely to leave lasting damage than the other two types. Chronic granulomatous infections like TB, MAI, and endemic fungal infections that are good at evading our immune system's attempts to clear them can sometimes manifest in two additional imaging patterns we haven't discussed yet. As fibroproductive lung opacities, usually in the upper lungs, and as a random or miliary nodular interstitial pattern. The pathophysiology of both of these is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I do discuss them in much more detail in my tuberculosis presentation. So when we're looking for lung infections, we'll also need to be cognizant for fibroproductive opacities, which may resemble a mixture of fibrosis consolidation in the upper lungs with associated distortion and sometimes cavitation, and for random nodular interstitial patterns characterized by innumerable discrete tiny dots distributed diffusely throughout both lungs. Despite how tiny the micronodules in a random miliary pattern may be because of their density and their numbers, a random miliary nodular pattern is often visible on chest radiography presenting in the lungs um, as a diffuse fine sandblasted appearance. When it comes to the pathogens responsible for lung infections, these are the usual suspects belonging to the bacterial, viral, and fungal kingdoms. Bacterial organisms can be basically divided between ordinary bacteria, mycobacteria, and mycoplasma. Staph aureus and pneumococcus are the most common gram-positive ordinary bacteria, while H. flu, Klebsiella, Legionella, and oral flora are the most common gram-negative ordinary bacteria. 
Fungi can be div um, divided between endemic um, organisms like Histococci crypto versus um, Pneumocystis or Aspergillus. A purely taxonomical approach, like on this slide, for categorizing lung infections might work if you're a PhD, but for many of us in healthcare, it's probably more practical to categorize lung infections based on how they present and how they are managed rather than strictly taxonomy. If we do this, we end up with 10 buckets or categories. Community acquired pneumonias, which can be caused by strep pneumo, mycoplasma, H flu, Klebsiella, Legionella, and oral flora. Aspiration pneumonias, which are not only caused by oral flora, but can be caused by Staph aureus, Strep pneumo, H flu, Klebsiella, or Legionella. Septic emboli, usually caused by Staph aureus or Strep pneumo. Viral infections, endemic fungal infections. And five pathogen specific buckets consolidative staphylococcal pneumonia, tuberculosis, non tubercular mycobacterial infection, pneumocystis, and aspergillus. And here they all are on a single list. The top two items, tuberculosis and septic emboli, are considered never missed diagnoses by many radiologists, while the next four, Community acquired pneumonia, viral pneumonia, non tubercular mycobacterial lung infection, and aspiration pneumonia are shouldn't miss diagnoses. The final four, consolidative staph pneumonia, endemic fungal infection, PJP, and aspergillus infections, are diagnoses for which clinical context may often be an important factor. Now, looking at this list, you may ask how come atypical pneumonia is absent? And that's because we generally discourage the use of the term atypical pneumonia because the term can mean different things to different people. When a radiologist um, uses this term, uh, what they have in mind may not necessarily be the same thing that a primary care physician, a pathologist, or microbiologist may be thinking. Now, let's go through key take-home points for each of the 10 lung infection categories, beginning with tuberculosis. Primary tuberculosis will often present as a tree and bud and centrolobular nodular pattern on CT that on chest radiography may often appear as a faint focal or multifocal heterogeneous lung opacities with indistinct margins. And sometimes if the tree and bud pattern predominates, a micronodular texture might just be detectable. Post-primary TB will usually present with opacities that are a combination of fibrosis and consolidation with associated architectural distortion and retraction. Cavitation can occur, and these opacities will usually appear in the apical and posterior segments of the upper lobes, and sometimes the superior segments of the lower lobes. With an active TB infection state, don't be surprised to see areas elsewhere in the lungs with a tree and bud or central lobular pattern typical of infection in an earlier state. Hematogenously disseminated tuberculosis will typically present with a random or miliary nodular interstitial pattern and may occur in the setting of both primary or post-primary tuberculosis. Also remember, a miliary pattern is suspicious for but not specific for disseminated TB since hematogenously disseminated non-tubercular mycobacterial and endemic fungal infections can also do this, as can some metastatic malignancies too. And lastly, remember that the imaging features of active TV, especially earlier on, can sometimes be imperceptible on chest radiography. When doing a chest radiography read for patients with a positive tuberculin skin test or positive um, serum quantiferin, I'll generally issue an impression of no evidence of active TB infection if the chest x-ray is normal, if all I see is a calcified lung granuloma, or if lung opacities, usually upper lung fibroproductive opacities or fibrosis, can be shown to have been stable for at least six months. For other lung or pleural situations, um, like other lung opacities, pleural effusion, uh, highly or mediastinal fullness for which the chronicity is either unknown or less than six months, you can't reliably exclude active TB using a chest radiograph. Remember, that TB can manifest in atypical ways in patients who are moderately or severely immunosuppressed. 
presenting in lung as regional consolidation, or even sometimes as masses, or with an empyema, or with bulky necrotic lymphadenopathy, as a phlegmon invading chest wall, or Potts disease of the spine, or even involving solid organs like the kidney or perhaps brain. Septic emboli. Septic emboli usually originate from a soft tissue infection, often at an IV access site or an IV drug infection site that progresses to a local infectious venous thrombophlebitis. Staph aureus is the most common organism. Infected venous thrombi from the local thrombophlebitis can get swept downstream to the lungs where they become lodged in small peripheral pulmonary arteries and grow into larger nodules or cause a pulmonary infarct. Septic emboli are seldom solitary. Whenever we encounter a patient with multiple irregularly marginated peripheral lung nodules, septic emboli must always be considered as one potential cause. Septic emboli nodules can be solitary or cavitary, and patients will usually have a concurrent bacteremia. Endocarditis is also common in the setting of septic emboli, and the damage can be severe and progress quickly, often requiring urgent cardiac valve replacement. Therefore, septic emboli are a never-miss type of lung infection on imaging. Even when caught early, septic emboli can be challenging to treat. Community-acquired pneumonias. Community-acquired pneumonias commonly present as a region of consolidation, sometimes low bar in extent. In a patient with low bar consolidation, um, this will be the diagnosis we typically think of first. Most common pathogen is strep pneumonia, strep pneumo, um, though in alcoholics, it's important to remember Klebsiella. Klebsiella pneumonia can sometimes capitate. Viral pneumonia. The imaging presentation of viral pneumonias can be quite diverse, ranging from centrilobular and tree and bud nodular patterns, to multi acinar opacities, to ground glass opacities, to consolidation, and sometimes a combination of any of these features. Distributions may be focal, multifocal, or diffuse. Since bacterial superinfection is possible, lung infections presenting with a heterogeneous asymmetric pattern could represent viral infection in isolation or a viral infection with bacterial superinfection. In half of cases, the opacities of viral pneumonia may be mild enough to be only detectable on CT imaging and invisible on a chest radiograph. Non-tubercular mycobacterial lung infections. Non-tubercular mycobacterial lung infections such as MAI classically present as a multifocal tree and bud pattern with associated bronchial wall thickening, bronchial dilation, and mosaic attenuation. However, non-tubercular mycobacterial infections can sometimes present with these imaging features, but in a unifocal distribution. Non-tubercular mycobacterial infections are also referred to as TB mimickers in that they can mimic the ways TB present, for example, uh, with a post-primary type appearance, like on this image, featuring a cavitary apical fibroproductive opacity. Other patterns, such as a miliary or random nodular interstitial pattern, are also possible, but much more uncommon. Aspiration pneumonia. The imaging features of aspiration pneumonia usually include a centrilobular nodular pattern, tree and bud nodular pattern, and consolidation. The distribution of these opacities tend to be in the dependent regions of the lungs. Airways are often abnormal in the setting of aspiration pneumonia. Uh, they, they can appear dilated, their walls thickened, often with fluid or mucoid impactions um, too. Since the aspiration of gastric acids can lead to adhesive atelectasis, it's not unusual to observe an element of partial volume loss in opacified regions, like in this example, or even as parenchymal bands or wedge-shaped lung opacities. The pathogens cultured from aspiration pneumonias are not always um, oral flora. Sometimes um, bacteria we may associate with community-acquired pneumonia, such as strep pneumo, for example, could be a culprit. Consolidative staph pneumonia. Consolidative staph pneumonias are rapidly progressive lung infections that immunosuppressed individuals tend to be more prone to develop than immunocompetent individuals and associated with a high rate of mortality. They can evolve quickly from central lobular and tree and bud pattern to multi opacities and bronchopneumonia to consolidation. Consolidative staph pneumonias can cavitate and are associated with empyema in many cases. Endemic fungal infections. Endemic fungal infections exist in many regions of the world. 
Here in the United States, histoplasmosis is endemic throughout the Ohio River Valley, while coccidiomycosis is endemic throughout the Southwest and cryptococcus um, endemic along the West Coast. Endemic fungal infections usually present as solitary or multiple one to three centimeter lung nodules that may be entirely solid or sometimes cavitary. Other patterns such as consolidation can occur from time to time, often in immunosuppressed patients. Imaging presentations that mimic TB, such as apical fibroproductive opacities, or even a heterogeneously disseminated infection state resulting in a, uh, sorry, a hematogenously disseminated state uh, resulting in a miliary random nodular pattern can rarely occur too. Pneumocystis. Pneumocystis is an opportunistic fungal infection that may occur in moderately and severely immunosuppressed individuals, and it's common to place folks with HIV and low CD4 counts, organ transplants, and leukemia on prophylactic regimens. PJP infections usually present as diffuse bilateral isolated ground glass lung opacities, and pleural effusions are typically absent. Because ground glass opacities are much easier to hide on chest radiography than consolidation, Chest radiographs in the setting of PJP infections can sometimes appear normal. In severe cases, much less than commonly encountered these days, the infection can progress from ground glass lung opacities to consolidation and become visible on chest radiography. Pneumatoceles can occur in cases where PJP is severe or suboptimally treated, resulting in what some folks refer to as cystic PJP. In cases of cystic PJP, as with other cystic lung diseases, patients may be at risk for spontaneous pneumothoraces. Aspergillosis. Aspergillosis is a fungal infection that can occur in two major forms, a non-invasive form in normal, in normal to mildly immunosuppressed people, and an invasive form in severely and moderately immunosuppressed people. The non-invasive form of aspergillosis occurs in folks with normal immunity and requires a pre-existing lung cavity. The cause of the pre-existing cavity here in the United States is most often pulmonary sarcoidosis or cystic fibrosis, while worldwide, the most common cause of the cavity is tuberculosis. In the non-infectious aspergillosis um, state, aspergillus hyphae ensconce themselves inside a pre-existing cavity and grow. Eventually, a ball of dead tissue and fungal hyphae develop within the cavity, which that folks refer to as a fungus bowl or as an aspergilloma. Although there's usually um, little lung inflammation in the environment out around the cavity, there's always a risk of hemorrhage within the cavity, which is a reason why many non-invasive aspergillosis cases may get treated and not left alone. The invasive form of aspergillosis occurs in severely immunosuppressed individuals. When there's little threat of an immune response, aspergillus hyphae don't require a sequestered space like a pre-existing cavity to grow inside of. They can just grow aggressively in normal lung parenchyma itself, forming a nodule or lung nodules that can grow quite quickly. Hyphae growing in this setting don't respect anatomic ground boundaries and can barrel through airways and blood vessels. And when a blood vessel gets invaded in this way, um, bleeding can occur. And result in an appearance we call a ground glass halo around that nodule. In more severe cases, life-threatening alveolar hemorrhage can occur. Now, let's summarize some of the major imaging teaching points about lung infections and put it on a single table for you. There are 10 major categories of lung infection. You've got viral pneumonia, community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, and consolidative staph pneumonia. Tuberculosis and its two imaging mimics, non-tubercular mycobacterial infection and endemic fungal infection. And you've got septic emboli, aspergillosis, and pneumocystis. There are several imaging features that can occur in the setting of a lung infection. The classic ones, ground glass opacity, consolidation, central lobular nodular pattern, tree and bud nodular pattern, multi astronomer lung opacities, and nodules. And finally, two patterns that can occur in the setting of chronic granulomatous lung infections, fibroproductive opacities and the miliary or random nodular pattern. If we take an example like viral lung infection, we've learned that these can present as ground glass opacities, consolidation or a mixture of both, centrolobular nodular pattern, tree and bud nodular pattern, or as multi opacities. 
Now, using purple to denote common associations and gray to denote the less common, though possible associations for the rest of this table, this is what we've arrived at. And what we wanted to sort of internalize when we approach lung infections on imaging. And we do this remembering what the rules of the road are for radiologists when it comes to diagnosing lung infections. Be safe. Don't miss highly contagious infections that can pose a substantial public health problem like tuberculosis. Be safe. Don't miss rapidly progressive infections that can quickly kill a patient like septic emboli or invasive aspergillosis. After you've got that covered, just do your best to provide, to provide folks with an educated guess about what's going on to the best of your ability.